Welcome to this online lecture series on a revolutionary new way of understanding the Bible. Developed by Eugen Drevermann, an internationally best-selling author of more than a hundred books. In this series, we look particularly at how Drevermann helps us read the Gospel of Mark in ways that connect with our experiences today. Today we will talk about the Bible and myth. What is historically true in the Bible is a question that has preoccupied people since the advent of modernity, since Enlightenment reason developed a method called historical criticism, uh, which it has used to investigate the truth claims of past stories and narratives. Now, the notion of historical has typically been understood in the sense of something objective, externally true about facts. So it has been about external objective facts. But the big question is whether this is really what religious texts, sacred texts, are actually trying to talk about, what they're really trying to convey to us. If you take a poem such as, for instance, Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, you will understand that there is another way of conceiving of historical, a way that focuses on the most profound subjective experience of reality. This is an inner historical sense. The lines from the poem, but a caged bird stands on the grave of dreams. His shadow shouts, his shadow shouts on a nightmare scream. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied. So he opens his throat to sing. The caged bird sings with a fearful trill of things unknown, but longed for still, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the caged bird sings of freedom. This poem, without ever mentioning directly the external historical fact of slavery and racism, conveys in symbolic form, by means of poetry, the inner sense of slavery and racism of oppressed people. Thus, the poem expresses in an absolutely valid way something truly historical, namely the sense of lived experience without ever reporting any actual historical facts. This, Dravermann argues, is very similar to the way religious texts have to be understood. The very texts which historical criticism has shown us not to ac accurately describe actual, that is, external historical facts. They instead condense inner lived experiences of absolute validity. Now, throughout the ages, one of the key claims of Christianity has been that everything in the Bible happened historically, literally, in the way it is described. Literalism. Many churches, even today, here in the United States, many de non-denominational churches uh, require that one gives allegiance to uh, literal inerrancy of the scripture. The idea is that everything happened exactly the way it is 
written. And ex happening exactly means external physically. If the Bible is God's word, so the reasoning is, then there cannot be any myth in it. Because God can really do anything. And who are we humans to say that God can't and that the stories are on only myth? This happens in all forms of Christianity, whether in conservative evangelicalism, in mainstream Protestantism, or in Vatican Catholicism. No less than Pope Benedict XVI writes in his book, Jesus of Nazareth, the infancy narratives about the story of the virgin birth of Jesus, the following, quote, is it true or is it possible that archetypal concepts have been transferred onto the figures of Jesus and his mother, unquote. Even though Benedict here does not explicitly mention Eugen Drevermann, he is in fact arguing with Drevermann's interpretation of the virgin birth story here. In particular, he is arguing with this book, Discovering the Godchild Within a spiritual psychology of the infancy of Jesus. This is one of the books that alarmed Benedict XVI all the way back in 1986 and 1987, and it eventually led him to put pressure on Dravermann's archbishop to take his license to teach away and even to strip him from his right to preach and which eventually led to the suspension from the priesthood of Drevermann. What is at stake when we hear about Benedict XVI arguing that the virgin birth has to be thought of as historically true in the external sense? Well, in this book, Infancy Stories of uh, Jesus, uh, Discovering the Godchild uh, Within, Driverman writes the following, quote, the question can't be, how can myth be proved to be historical reality? But, how do we understand the truth or the peculiar reality of a myth, such as the story of the birth of a divine redeemer? Is there nothing beyond the enlightenment dichotomy between myth and history? Can we talk credibly about God only by granting a monopoly to the language of historical facts? or by losing ourselves in ahistorical dreams. And so Drevermann is actually trying to mediate in his approach between historical facts and dreams, so to speak. Now here's what Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, Benedict the Sixteenth argues. He argues in fact, that one can talk credibly only about God by granting a monopoly to the language of historical facts. Here is how he writes about it that way. He writes in his book on the infancy of Jesus, it, again in response to his unnamed counterpart, Trevermann, quote, there are two moments in the story of Jesus when God intervenes directly in the material world, the virgin birth and the resurrection from the tomb, in which Jesus did not remain nor see corruption. These two moments are a scandal to the modern spirit. God is allowed to act on in ideas and thoughts 
in the spiritual domain, but not in the material. That is shocking. He does not belong there. But that is precisely the point. God is God, and he does not operate merely on the level of ideas. In that sense, what is at stake in both of these moments, namely in the stories of virgin birth and resurrection, is God's very Godhead. The question that they raise is, does matter belong to him? The virgin birth and the real resurrection from the tomb are the cornerstones of faith. If God does not also have power over matter, then he simply is not God. But he does have this power. And through the conception and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he has ushered in a new creation. Now, this kind of claim is what leads countless people into atheism because the question very quickly emerges well, if God can intervene in the material world in this direct way, why does God not prevent natural disasters? Why does God not prevent cancer in children? Why does not God prevent wars? Why does God not prevent famines that lead to hunger? Now, Pope Benedict XVI, Joseph Ratzinger, here is the representative for a form of theology of the study of faith in God that wants to solve the problems that the historical study of the Bible presents to us. Because the problem that historical criticism has presented us with over the past 250 years is that at crucial moments in the biblical texts, there's no historical certainty to be found. Benedict XVI's solution, as the solution of many other theologians, is to simply declare by faith that these facts must be historical. Otherwise, God is not God. But this very attitude, Traverman points out, ends up serving only the power of church officials over people by telling people what they have to believe, lest they be excluded from the group of the faithful. This approach ultimately is intellectually dishonest and psychologically and existentially coercive. Now, Dravermann tries to offer a radical alternative solution to bridge the gap between ideas and facts, between myth and history, by looking at religious stories as stories that talk about meaningful history, meaningful reality. So let us listen to how he goes about this in the Gospel of Mark. And we will today look at the third section of his introduction to the commentary of the Gospel of Mark. Um, this is the commentary in German, and I am in the process of translating this. And the plan is that this will become available in English. <clears throat> 
But before I read from Drevermann, I'd like to briefly recap what we uh, just uh, what we did in the last few sectures to place this part today in that context. In our previous lectures, we talked about the background of the universal human experience of feeling caught in anxiety and in despair. And that religious stories actually are talking about these kinds of experiences. The beginning chapters of the book of Genesis describe it as a fall due to anxiety into desperate and futile attempts at self-redemption. And the Gospel of Mark describes it with the language of possession by evil spirits. Dravermann traced these experiences to the sense of having one's existence annihilated by messages and inner voices that we are not good enough, that we don't matter, and that we should hide our true selves. Now, the Gospel of Mark is all about what happens when we have come, become aware of that dynamic in us and when we long for an end to all of that world of fear and anxiety and of the facade and for a world of trust and truth. And the Gospel of Mark portrays what now happens as this world of fear and despair and evil breaks down. It does so by describing experiences that have apocalyptic features. Treverman writes, we understand from an inner perspective that experiences of this kind must in their very nature show apocalyptic features. It is therefore far more than a simple historical, it is therefore far more than a simple religion historical fact that the Gospel of Mark in particular portrays the life of Jesus as the beginning of the apocalypse of all of human history. When it becomes evident that any true talk of God in this world of misery is deadly, or even more, when we only meet the normal state of every de everyday deadly practice to understand the inner inevitability with which Jesus gets liquidated after only a brief time of public appearance based on a meticulous process of legality, in a juridically cold and clean way, because all groups in religion and politics have an interest in his death, then one can no longer believe that in the man from Nazareth, the true and actual, the only really human life has begun without urgently and impatiently wishing the outright demise of this world of death. Jesus expected the realm of God to be within reach in the lives of people. And the early church longed badly for the end of this world. Yet, if we want to avoid the conclusion that the concrete details of apocalyptic descriptions, including those in the Gospel of Mark, are merely due to the historical time period, then we must again focus on the psychological experience expressed in the images and ideas that time and again portray the collapse of the entire existing world by means of the apocalyptic visions in the religious traditions of peoples. Here again, historical critical analysis, uh, here again, historical critical exegesis necessarily needs depth psychology in order to understand its own findings. To understand the apocalyptic worldview of the Gospel of Mark, we must keep in mind from the perspective of depth psychology, especially the doomsday fantasies in psychosis. 
they provide the best commentary on the tremendous tension and strain in the soul of a human being for whom first the entire world must disintegrate into dust or must be flooded by the sea before they can see the sun of humanity coming with the clouds of heaven as is written in mark 14 verse 62 following daniel 7 verse 13. what gets projected again and again into scenes of horrible battles and wars between the powers of good and evil the children of light and the children of darkness in the apocalyptic literature of all eras and areas are not contemporary historically conditioned fantasies of resentment and revenge rather we here have archetypal patterns of imagination that lie ready in every human being and which emerge whenever our identity as persons is deeply threatened or when we can no longer avoid the discovery that everything that so far counted and had to count as i originates from a terrible misidentification with ideals and expectations that can only suffocate deform and distort the essence of the real self just as mark 13 portrays it under such circumstances the holy city must first be stormed and plundered indeed the whole world with its seemingly iron laws must first collapse so that the form of the true eye of the son of humanity in the language of myth is able to come down from heaven to earth so that in other words the calling of our being and destiny can be realized in reality for sure in all the mysterious speeches and images of apocalypticism mark also wants to invoke and interpret certain historical experiences of his time especially the fall of jerusalem it also it is also certain that in doing so he took up already written texts and reinterpreted them in substance quite significantly in his own way by making relatively minor changes but the fall of jerusalem in 70 of our current era however decisive for the history of judaism and the early church nevertheless becomes a religious event of lasting validity an essential image of redemption and misery in the life of every human being only through the language of myth by way of archetypal symbolism only by means of that language can past history elevate itself into the sphere of ex of eternal validity exegesis has again and again pointed out the mythical image which pervades the whole theological presentation of the gospel of mark an image which not only encompasses the apocalyptic struggle between God and Satan, but also centrally the figure of Jesus as the dying and resurrected son of God himself. Others have argued against this, that while it is true that the Gospel of Mark and the tradition before it contains Christological titles, miracles, and prophecies but that it does not yet want to elevate the figure of jesus to a higher superhuman being and here driverman quotes rudolf pesch who writes for mark who seems to stand in jewish christian tradition 
which today is actually uh, somewhat contested, albeit turned toward the mission to the heathens, Jesus comes from Nazareth in Galilee, and it is this Jesus who is the Messiah anointed with God's Spirit, the Son of Man and the Son of God, who had to suffer and was raised from the dead. End of the quote by Rudolf, Rudolf Pesch. But even if it is true that one may not yet presuppose a developed Christology, in the Gospel of Mark, in the sense of later church dogmatics. It is nevertheless important to see how much the Gospel of Mark has already distanced itself from Jewish orthodoxy. We are dealing here not only with the question whether Jesus is really, despite or precisely because, of his condemnation by the Sanhedrin, the God-sent Messiah of the end times, promised by the prophets. What is decisive is that Mark goes far beyond the Jewish theology of the Messiah and takes up the idea of the dying and resurrected Son of God. And this is the idea which, together with the mythical elements of Jewish apocalypticism, pushes Christianity to precisely that further development, which Matthew and Luke will a little later add to Mark's, Mark's model. Both, meaning Matthew and Luke, describe in logical consequence and in quite appropriate completion of Mark's gospel, how the Son of God, who is to liberate the world from the rule of evil spirits in the days of the end times, by the power of his miracles and the power of his words, is born from heaven to earth by a virgin as promised by angels, how he takes death upon himself and after overcoming the kingdom of sin and death is taken up into heaven again. It seems that the gospel of Mark only prepares for this cycle by taking up the ancient Egyptian myth of the destiny of the sun meaning the sun uh, in the sky, and its royal sun, meaning the pharaoh, by not, not, but not by transferring it in its entirety to Christ. And yet it, meaning the Gospel of Mark, already employs the image of the Egyptian feast of the ascension to the throne in order to portray Jesus as the Son of God in connection with ancient archetypal ideas. Trevorman talks a lot, describes a lot about the, the uh, connection that exists between the story of the virgin birth in the Gospels and the in thronization of the pharaoh who then was declared to be born by a virgin birth on the day he took to the throne. And then Draberman describes here briefly this uh, pattern uh, that is similar in Egyptian mythology and in the gospel's description of the son of the uh, son of god ascending now it remains to be seen to what extent it can be shown through the study of the history of religions that this scheme in the gospel of mark depends directly on the mythical ideas of non-jewish religions especially of ancient egypt Far more important than the question of the historical origins of certain religious views is the question what experiences are necessary in order to call such archetypal images onto the scene as symbols for a corresponding experiential reality. Inherent in the history of every religion lies the great danger to abandon the level of religious experience 
in favor of quickly repeatable reflexive formulas of past experience of faith. That is, that the original intuition soon becomes mere tradition and finally pure con convention. So here we hear Dreverman addressing what Benedict XVI in a, uh, just a moment uh, described in the passage that we uh, heard about. What Dreverman argues is that if the church just simply declares certain uh, ideas in the Bible, in the stories, as historical facts that are objective and are actually removed from our own experience, then what it does is it actually leaves our experiences behind. So that is Dreverman's concern here in responding to the kind of theology that uh, Benedict XVI represents. To continue, that is why, especially in the interpretation of a gospel, we need to take great care at every turn that the individual images and statements, indeed the entire theological framework of ideas of the gospel, are made transparent with respect to the underlying forms of faith, instead of getting bogged down in the discussion of the respective historically predetermined formulas of faith, like dogmas or tenets of faith that one has to believe as historical facts, lest one is not a believer. The task, Draverman continues, is to recreate and redream each individual step and vision of divine revelation as an expressionistic poetry of human existence in relationship to God until the truth of the texts is revealed from within and no longer has to be learned by heart as a doctrine from the outside or be commented on and commemorated in a purely historical way. Only with this attitude towards the gospel tradition does at the same time a problem get solved, which has repeatedly been raised by historical exegesis, historical critical exegesis, but which can never be answered within the framework of this method. The difference between the message of faith and the historical reality that causes it. Now, here is something that directly really responds to Benedict XVI in Dreverman's writing here. Dreverman writes, if one does not want to declare stories of this kind in a fundamentalist fashion to be, the his to be historical accounts, then the crucial question arises, what kind of reality? it is that can only be communicated through the symbolic language of myth. Only from the perspective of depth psychology can one regain, beyond Boltmann's critique, the objective validity of the symbols of faith. And so I need to briefly say what Boltmann stands for. So Rudolf Boltmann, is well known for his so-called demythologization project. Uh, Bultmann was an eminent New Testament scholar who uh, found in his research, in his historical research, that uh, many of the central tenets of the Bible, the stories of the Bible, have no historical footing. And so, what Boltmann uh, argued was that the biblical narratives use myth to describe 
an existential truth. And so Bultmann argued that we can just strip the mythic uh, language and basically distill the existential essence of these stories. Uh, so that they, for instance, talk about existential meaningless and finding existential meaning, uh, all in relation to God, Wildman argued, but it could be stripped of its mythological images. Now, Drevermann's approach is also a response to Boltmann. So Drevermann basically tries to find a middle way between uh, theologians like Benedict the Sixteenth uh, and Boltmann on the one hand, and also atheists on the other hand. Uh, or historical critical scholars that are completely removed from the actual experience of faith that these stories talk about. Now, to regain the objective validity of the symbols of faith, we need to think about the very limits of the method of historical criticism. So what Drevermann argues is that there's actually some objective validity in the symbols of faith. The imagery is not irrelevant, even though the imagery does not talk, describe external historical facts. So a story like the ascension into uh, the sky, into heaven by Jesus, is not him flying up into the sky uh, physically. That's not what a story like this describes, but the story describes something that is essential uh, to the experience of faith that this story wants to talk about. Now, Drevermann recognizes the fact that historical, the historical critical study of the Bible, guided by the, quote, ideal of obje objectivity of the modern idea of science, unquote, led to the realization that while the Gospels portray the faith of the early church, they do not provide historically reliable statements from Jesus or about Jesus. Historical criticism thus made out of the history of Jesus, the study of the history of the ideas of faith of the early church. And this is my summary. Even when exegetes became again somewhat less skeptical of the historicity of the gospels than Rudolf Bultmann had been, the problem basically remains the same. And here I quote Drevermann again, one cannot base faith, one's own life, on the accidental discovery of historical research. It is absurd to try to base an on or outright replace with a scribal procedure of hypothetical bridges to the past, the living relationship of faith to the God of the living, not of the dead as Mark 12, 27 states. And in a footnote, Trevermann writes that he agrees with Rudolf Boltmann, uh, who stated in his book, Jesus Christ and Mythology, uh, which is in the English edition on page 16 and 17. Uh, he, he agrees with this statement of world months. His person, namely Jesus, is viewed in the light of mythology when he is said to have been begotten of the Holy Spirit and born of a virgin, and this becomes clearer still in Hellenistic Christian communities where he is understood to be the Son of God in a metaphysical sense, a great pre-existent heavenly being who became man for the sake of our redemption and took on himself suffering and even the suffering of the cross. 
it is evident that such conceptions are mythological. Now, what mythological means here is it uses the language of myth to express, though, a reality. The question, of course, is what kind of reality? And what Dravermann argues is what kind of reality that actually should be called historical. So Dravermann goes on, the only question now is what follows from this? Bultmann tried to explain historically the fact of the mythological way the Bible and Christian dogmatics speak. His tragedy was, and is in the context of historical critical exegesis, that what is understood historically in this way was and had to be devalued as part of history itself. However, it is also possible, and in terms of Christian dogmatics, indispensable to show evidence of the truth of the mythological images, and thus to deepen Bultmann's existential hermeneutics with the help of depth psychology in such a way that it becomes suitable to the concrete content of the mythical images. Instead of concluding from the uncertainty of objective historical facts that the point of the stories is not the reporting of external objective facts, historical criticism keeps acting as if that is the point. Instead, it should admit that, quote, the stories which the early communities of believers invented about Jesus are true poetic creations of a believing and hence believable human existence that moves from the destructive work of anxiety to the healing experience of a deeper trust. Trevorman continues, it is true and correct when theologians repeatedly remind us that in order to establish faith, the person of Jesus of Nazareth must be thought of as a historical figure. But from this does not follow that one must, quote, know Christ according to the flesh, unquote, from 2 Corinthians 5.16, in order to find the kind of trust that has taken shape in the person of Jesus in relation to God. The Gospel of Mark does indeed speak of the historical Jesus, but it does so with the help of narratives that tell the story of Jesus in the only religiously relevant way that can claim significance for people of all eras and areas in the way of symbolic condensation. The object of such descriptions is not what one could perceive externally about Jesus of Nazareth. Rather, the question and the content of the gospel traditions is what reality becomes visible when one gets involved with Jesus. It is not the externally observable outside of historical facts, which is unimportant for faith, but the effect of the inner truth of the figure of Jesus on the self-experience and self-interpretation of people in the midst of the tightrope walk between anxiety and faith that forms the level of reality that can absolutely be called historical in this eminently religious and therefore symbolic, hence unhistorical mode of representation of the Bible. I want to interject here briefly that those who are familiar with psychoanalysis, especially with the current, the, the most prevalent or uh, developed form of psychoanalysis, so-called relational psychoanalysis or intersubjective psychoanalysis, will see that Dravermann is basically talking about how the experience of Jesus 
was experienced by those who experienced healing or who experienced being able to trust themselves and God again. It is through that experience of trust that everything changed. And a method of study needs to be found that will get at those experiences of trust. And this is the reason why Draberman argues depth psychology or psychoanalysis, but also analytical psychology of a Jungian type, those together are so important today for under understanding these stories. And that is why they are so important to integrate into exegetical study of the texts. I'll go back here to Dravermann's uh, writing. Therefore, paradoxically, it can often happen that narratives that appear in historical criticism as unhistorical must be regarded in psychological perspective, also in a historical sense, as inwardly true and absolutely credible. The relation of religious traditions to history is basically not a relation of history to events, but of a symbol to reality. And what appears in historical critical exegesis again and again as a gap between fiction and fact receives its meaning only if one interprets it as an interplay of experiential impression and communicative expression on the level of symbolic signifiers. The state of affairs concerning the question of historical truth in biblical exegesis is essentially no different from that in the psychology of memory during analytical therapy. And Drivermann goes here into talking about how psychoanalysis works with uh, dreams and with memories, and he connects with Freud's term of screen memories, meaning that in our memory, we don't necessarily always uh, remember, or, or most often actually, we don't uh, remember things exactly the way they happened, but we remember them based on the significance they had for us. And in dreams, there may not be much of actual history, but there may be the actual meaning of a relationship we had or of an experience we had with somebody. But the dream doesn't portray it in historical facts, but in symbolic form. Now, Dravermann gives an example uh, of applying this method of interpretation. Uh, and I'll go into that now. The story of the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain just mentioned uh, from Mark 9, 2 to 13, and Dreverman had mentioned this earlier, I, I did not read that here, uh, provides a good example of the fact that texts, psychologically seen, can also be true in a historical sense, although from a historical critical point of view, they must definitely be regarded as unhistorical. We find a way out of the dilemma only if one recognizes and admits that there are and can be invented fables which are very well contained in a symbolic sense, which very well contain in a symbolic sense a historical truth. And even more, that they can that they contain an ex eternally valid meaning although they have never happened in an external historical sense, in an external historical sense. Such truth, however, cannot be found by examining the text of a gospel objectively with regard to its historically conditioned consciously intended meanings. 
If one approached it that way, one would only impose the same separation of statement of faith and belief in existence on the respective narrative already at the beginning, which always appears at the end as a result of all historical critical investigations. In reality, speaking in religious symbols essentially serves the purpose of undoing the subject-object split that underlies the modern concept of science. And it is therefore a question of whether we allow our own method of interpretation to be corrected from the biblical text in order to adjust the way of listening to the peculiarity of religious texts, or whether for the sake of an unsuitable concept of science, we interpret religious texts in such a way that they are in principle no longer able to do what they want to do, to take hold of the reader in such a way that he dives with his existence into the encompassing mystery which can never become object because it is that subject to which we first owe being able to be subject in the first place, God. Stories in which God speaks cannot be understood objectively, but only by being affected most intensely in our subjectivity. Nevertheless, such an exegetical attitude, which includes the subject in the process of understanding, is not unscientific. It only follows other rules of interpretation than those prescribed by the objectivity ideal of modern times that in principle excludes any form of religiosity. Here we also see Dreverman doing something radically postmodern, if we want to introduce this term here. He brings in the subjectivity that has been excluded, or Foucault would say subjugated, in the traditional way of doing exegesis. Let me continue here. Essentially for this reason, to exegesis, if it wants to be a theological method, today needs depth psychology because the letter offers a model of scientific knowledge, which for the purpose of personal understanding, demands, describes, and makes possible the use of one's person with one's own feelings, expectations, interests, needs, and transferences. One cannot understand a religious text in any other way than one tries to understand a friend by being interested essentially in the soulful meaning of her communications rather than in the level of facts and thoughts and by furthermore giving more attention and importance to the unconscious expressions of her words and behaviors than to the consciously arranged attempts of her self-expression presentation. In a certain sense, one must literally dream with the other their dreams in order to understand them deeply enough. If one does so, one will soon find it no longer strange at all, but quite normal and natural that someone, for example, 20 years after the death of a person close to them, can dream a dream, an imagined fable that shows them who the other person really was. It should be noted that the dreamer today no longer has any new historical information at their disposal. Indeed, they will have forgotten much of historical reality, falsified it in their memory and supplemented or reshaped some of it from their own imaginative activity in such a way that it does not seem to have the slightest thing in common with the course of real history. And still, it is possible that they only today after years become first truly able through their dreams to express the actual meaning, the inner truth of the other person in condensed symbolic scenes so clearly and appropriately as they would never have been able to do while the beloved was alive. What appears to be mere fantasy in historical criticism often enough turns out from a psychological point of view to be the only possible further development and self-communication of what is merely historically past. 
of what is, however, psychologically everlasting. That which is historically invented is often to be understood from a psychological point of view precisely the condensation of the real essence of the life of the other. Certainly, one can and must still distinguish between true and false. Not all dreams are equally plausible and revelatory, but the criterion for that can no longer lie in the history itself, but must depend on the extent to which the corresponding dream reveals itself as a continued effect of the figure of the other, of their essential intentions and suggestions. In the case of Jesus, the connection between the redemption from anxiety and the counter-reaction of deadly defense and suffering provides above all the decisive criterion by which to measure which truth value certain narratives among the early churches continued dreaming of the figure of Jesus have. If assessed that way, the story of the transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain, to come back to it, can absolutely be called true. However, it is a truth of the historical Jesus, which can only be perceived with the eyes of the spirit, not with the external senses. And it is precisely the symbolic way of expression that reaches down into the zones where the truth of the images is at home. Symbolically read, it is important to ask in the story of the transfiguration of Jesus, what experiences in real life are meant when a person is said to be climbing the mountain of a valid manifestation of God. Such holy mountains form the center of the world in the mythology of the peoples. And thus the question already arises how one gets to the place where the world has its center. The Christian legend possesses a correct intuition when it transfers the appearance of Jesus to the mountain Tabor. Because, because Tabor means in Hebrew, the navel meaning of the world. It is the place where human existence returns to its center. It is the place of the world where the sky touches the earth and the human heart is very close to God. But what happens when a person leaves the lowlands of life and sets out against the law of gravity to gain a vantage point from which the whole world seems to lie at her feet. It is a moment of perfect happiness, in which a person feels so removed from the world and so lifted up from the world, and thus we understand why, again and again, in such decisive moments, Jesus takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, with him. The number three represents in depth psychology the unity of the male personality. Obviously, only in the unity of the whole person, one can become capable of an encounter with God filled with happiness. But what does happiness mean in terms of content in relationship to God? The story of the transfiguration of Jesus says that in order to be happy, one essentially needs a knowledge of the mission of one's own life that is gradually revealed. Moses and Elijah, the two Hebrew Bible figures, who were able to lead God's people to freedom from human oppression and demon fear, speak on the mountain with Jesus. And a voice from heaven confirms him as the beloved son of God. Certainly, such a scene contains a post-Easter confession of faith. But can we think that Jesus could ever have set out on the road of suffering without such a clarification of his own being and without such an exaltation of happiness?
we will only be able to accept and take upon ourselves as much suffering from within as we have experienced happiness. And even if there should never have been a Tabor experience of Jesus in an external historical sense, the Gospel of Mark is nevertheless fully correct when it declares that Jesus, the historical Jesus, must have been carried by the feeling of an unconditional acceptance by God and by the vision of a deep happiness in order to go over from the mountain of transfiguration to the mountain of suffering, to Golgotha. Now, formally, the story of the transfiguration of Jesus will be seen as a myth. And perhaps in the case of such obviously symbolic archetypal narratives, the necessity of a depth psychological interpretation will be admitted by some readers only to defend all the more fiercely the historicity of the other non-mythical narratives of the Bible. And I want to point out that Dreverman, in his major methodological study, Depth Psychology and Exegesis, in this second volume here, talks about how to understand myth psychologically. He argues that myth, as in contrast to other stories like legends, legends, prophecies, and so on, that myth project the unconscious, what's inside, so the archetypal inside, uh, onto the outside nature as an image of one's inner nature, one's inner experience. So if we were to apply this to this story, uh, what is happening here with the story of the transfiguration of Jesus is that the Mount Tabor, which has the significance of the navel of the world, the center of the world, becomes a symbol, becomes the projection plane of the unconscious archetypal images that describe an experience of the historical Jesus, of his personhood, of what he himself went through, his own inner experience. That is what depth psychology can do. So Dreverman continues, but the historical critical method faces the same problem in interpreting the Bible in all of its passages. And this is the end of our uh, passage for today. Even those stories that purport to be historical accounts, the miracle narratives, for instance, or the historical narratives in the true sense of the word, prove to be thoroughly thoroughly unhistorical from the point of view of criticism. And this even applies to stories about persons who, whose historical existence is beyond doubt. These stories too are legends and sagas, not historical narratives in the critical sense. So to conclude, as indispensable, Trevorman writes, as the historical critical method is, as a method of objective knowledge of the historical findings of the text, of a text, and as important as it was in freeing, freeing biblical interpretation from the rigidity of church dogmatism, it must, when it comes to religious insight, be supplemented by, method of by a method of interpretation that sufficiently validates the subjective aspect of understanding. And here, depth psychology, with its symbolic and empathic interpretive approaches, is the method of choice. 
depth psychology too holds no monopoly of choice. Um, no, depth psychology too holds no monopoly, monopoly claim or value in itself. But it is indispensable today to achieve something extremely important that the latent atheistic rift closes, which follows from the subject object split of the modern model of science. The rift between knowledge and faith, history and myth, thinking and feeling, reality and symbol human and God, and applied historically between the figure of Jesus of Nazareth and the Christ of the Christian proclamation. This concludes our lecture for today. I hope that you found this interesting, that you found it thought-provoking, how to read the Bible, even with the knowledge that many of its stories are not historically true in the external historical sense, but that they're nonetheless absolutely true in an inner sense where it counts, in the sense of the I-thou, that Martin Buber describes between God and humans, but that it does so with these images that connect to our own inner experience and that don't keep it just in a rationalistic way of repeating alleged facts of faith that really don't change anything on the inside. So if you found that interesting, listen in again next week. We will continue with actual stories in the Gospel of Mark and apply Drivermann's uh, understanding of biblical texts to these stories so that we get at what are these stories actually meaning for us today that they also meant for people back then the liberating and healing message that is actually expressed in these stories. Thank you for listening and have a good week.